Welcome students to lecture 15 of MHHS 1. After staying with the English department for a few weeks, we're moving on to other departments for the rest of the course. So for the next two lectures, uh, we actually won't be straying far, however. Uh, we'll be reading Gloria Kim's essay, Pathogenic Nation Making, Media Ecologies, and American Nationhood Under the Shadow of Viral Emergence. Kim is in UCR's Media and Cultural Studies Department, MCS. Um, I say we won't be straying too far um, because we've already gotten a taste of this disciplinary orientation with uh, Cheryl Vince's analysis of the short PBS films, um, Future States. Um, and this argument about, quote, pathogenic nation making has some relation to what we've learned about in my own essay on romantic disease discourse. Um, so, even though we're moving into a different department, there are still some strong connections to the material you've just read. And Cheryl Vint is also um, a part of the MCS department. Um, I want you to notice the date of this publication as well. Um, this essay was published in 2016, several years before the COVID-19 pandemic, but also several years after the SARS outbreak. So as you read this essay and watch these lectures, I want you to think about the implications of the argument post-COVID. Um, I'd wager it won't actually be that hard to find connections. And this is also a longer piece um, with a lot of moving parts. So as usual, I'll be breaking it down for you with our usual reading strategy. And hopefully it's been relatively successful so far. Um, in this lecture, I'll focus on, on just the introductory and concluding parts. And in the next lecture, I'll dive into the meaty middle part of the argument. Just as I started my essay with the history of the ICD and the DSM, Kim begins hers with the 1989 categorization of emerging infectious diseases, EIDs. This is the essay's historical starting point when public health institutions started calling on us to act preemptively against, quote, yet unknown microbial futures. So instead of merely reacting to the outbreaks of plague, smallpox, or flu, this new category of EIDs meant that we, uh, it meant that we, were, we were supposed to act preemptively with a, a new kind of paranoid affect to the spread of disease. Now, even though this is quite a long essay, um, it's nicely broken down already by Kim into sections. Uh, so let's take advantage of that as we ourselves try to break down the analysis here. Um, the opening vignette already introduces the primary object of study here. Quote, a seven minute long corporate documentary produced by IBM, Deadly Migration Outsmarting the Avian Flu Virus, 2010. Um, so I, I followed the YouTube link in the essay, but it actually seems like the video is no longer available. Um, maybe you can find it, but this is not a huge deal since Kim provides us with a really rich description of those seven minutes throughout her essay. The context seems quite strange. Um, from a period between 2008 to 2010, American Airlines passengers were forced to watch this short corporate film before watching their selected in-flight entertainment. Um, so for some historical context, this would have been after the SARS outbreak of 2002 to 2004 um, that spread to dozens of countries around the world. Kim's introductory vignette puts you in the position of that American Airlines flyer in the late 2000s, who is uh, just trying to watch some escapist Marvel movie like Iron Man, but is instead confronted with this really, really scary public health documentary. So this vignette belongs to the post-EID era, when we've labeled diseases new or emergent threats because they've started to affect the wealthy, quote, valuable people of the global north. Many of the diseases have long affected populations in the global south, but in 1991, um, according to Kim, the U.S. Institutes of Medicine, IOM, decided that, quote, Advanced systems of globalization, such as industrialization, mass migration, deforestation, climate change, global travel, and trade, had made it so that these diseases were no longer contained or containable to the global south. So, 
That's why Kim begins with the character of the American Airlines passenger, who is more than likely um, American and likely middle class since they can afford a plane ticket. So this is exactly the demographic that mattered to the IOM. Nationhood pretty much by definition means valuing your own nationals more than others. So EIDs then uh, became um, a really convenient way to preserve this idea of insular nationhood, even in the face of a globalizing, increasing, in increasingly networked world. Diseases could pass porously through borders. Um, so what can nationhood be if that's the case? Uh, what does uh, nationhood actually mean if nat national borders could be breached so easily in this way? These are the xenophobic questions that arise from what Kim calls the process of, quote, pathogenic nation making. We are in this pathogenic nation always preparing for the next pandemic. We exist in a state of what um, Kim calls, quote, preemptive biopreparedness. So this is something that people who lived through the Cold War would actually be really familiar with. Those that lived in that era were constantly afraid of nuclear annihilation in the tense standoff between the U.S. and the USSR. And it was something that we lived through and actually continue to live through in the counterterrorism state in which we are constantly told that we must be constantly and continuously vigilant lest another 9-11 happen. So what Kim means by pathogenic nation making is exactly that, is this paranoid construction of preemptive biopreparedness that distills the global issue of disease um, into something simpler, into an us versus them dynamic. In this blatantly xenophobic view, we are the ones trying to defend ourselves against the possible diseases of the future that arrive from anywhere but here. Um, this part of the argument, um, that whole argument, Kim acknowledges, comes from um, a bunch of other scholars like Priscilla Wald's very, very influential book, uh, Contagious uh, Cultures, Carriers, and the Outbreak Narrative. Those representational outbreak narratives, Wald has shown, have fortified national community by creating through fear and paranoia this sense of triumph against foreign disease, and constructing from this a kind of national unity. So, um, so that's Pris Priscilla Wald. So what is Kim's intervention in this essay? Kim's interesting question here is basically how does any of that actually work? How do those films, images, and print media do this kind of pathogenic nation making that Wald is talking about? So this is the MCS and MHHS question. How does that media work to shape the everyday feelings or affects of nationhood? This, mean th this means that she's continuing Wald's work, but paying a lot more attention to the role that mediation and media ecologies play in that process of pathogenic nation making. What's handy is that Kim also gives the uninitiated a quick definition of what she means by, quote, media ecologies. She says, quote, Emphasis on spaces, habits, situations, and materialities of mediation. In other words, a media ecological approach thinks not just about what the message is, a disease-free us versus a diseased them, but how that message arrives, or as Kim puts it, quote, the materialities of mediation. This means thinking about that one airline passenger, who they are, how they got there, and even the very finger that presses the touchscreen to control the in-flight in, uh, entertainment and all the media around that. Okay, so now I think we have all the definitions we need to understand the thesis um, of the article when it arrives in the last paragraph of the introductory section on page 446. Quote, this essay documents how media and media ecologies play a crucial role in mobilizing national collective affect around the project of preemptive biopreparedness. So this essay will show how pathogenic nation-making happens by investigating how media and media ecologies make and remake those national feelings of us versus them. 
This will happen um, in the essay in three major moments that Kim delineates in that last introductory paragraph. First, she will use the case of deadly migration, that weird IBM corporate documentary on American Airlines flights, uh, to show how future catastrophes are made to be felt in the present as a constant everyday threat. Second, she will get into the media ecologies bit. So remember that word ecologies is meant to evoke spaces, habits, situations, and materialities. So in this part of the introduction, Kim gives us a list of what those uh, media ecologies might look like. Quote, messages, warnings, reminders, and instructions. Those constructed spaces and coordinated habits create an atmosphere of catastrophe that collectivize feeling around a kind of shared paranoia. Now, thirdly and finally, that anxious collective affect takes, uh, takes ultimate shape into an idea of U.S. nationhood. So there's the thesis that'll prepare us to, div that'll prepare us to, to, to dive into the first section called, quote, visualizing the shifting futures of emergence, in which we'll learn more about how deadly migration functions as media and media ecology. What we get in this section is a detailed walkthrough, um, what I called a rich description before with Cheryl Vint's essay of that seven minute film. So in that, rich description, Kim shows how the logic of emergence is constantly visualized for us in the film. So let's go through the um, let's let's go through the argument here by going through the visual figures that we have in this section. So first, um, in figure one, Kim calls this quote, graphically rhyming images. And we can sort of see what she means in this image. We, see, uh, we, we can see how the cell clusters start to look like the avian flock, and then the avian flock starts to look like the Chinese crowd. This is that epiphanic moment that we're used to in, in procedural dramas um, when the protagonist has uncovered a vast conspiracy by connecting bits of clipped newspaper articles and ephemera with lengths of yarn um, all thumbtacked onto corkboard. So the graphical rhyme. Um, in this image is meant to signal to us, uh, it all makes perfect sense now. Um, so figure two uh, continues that corkboard scene um, as we track the vectors of contagion from the swan to Ming Xiao, to Ming Xiao's cousin, to the airline passenger, and finally to everyone on the airplane. Figure three finally scales that up to global significance as we see the dispersion of the air, uh, airline passengers all over the place. So what's interesting, Kim notes, however, is that this global scale of pandemic is all couched in the language of provincial nationalism. Only US cities are mentioned, and the imperative is always about closing the borders to the avian trespassers, uh, these birds who just fly around without any passports. And to scare us even more, figure four, shows us the perspective projected casualties if we don't act now to the rhythm of a, uh, if we don't act now, um, and this is all set to the rhythm of a, of a beating heart. And in, the, in, in figure five, we see an image of a vast peaceful mountain range as if to suggest that the US landscape has been stripped of human populations. By figure six, the documentary starts to suggest that we can find comfort in the techno-scientific innovations that come from corporations like IBM. The figure shows us a bunch of technical data and the promise that the vigilance of techno-scientific preparedness will triumph over the looming threat. Now, the map of figure seven is meant to convey what Kim calls the language of anticipation and emergence. And finally, in figure eight, we just get a black screen with an avian call to drive home this anticipation of the emergent threats to come, a quote, placeholder for a future that fundamentally cannot be represented. Even though we might not be able to see the film ourselves, and again, maybe you'll be able to find it, um, this series of eight images and Kim's rich description gives us a very good idea, I think, of the film's purpose. It constructs a language of anticipation and emergence of future threats 
to construct an idea of national unity and security based on the imperative of biological um, preparedness. This visual language of emergence is meant to make us stare into the horizon rather than address the public health crises of the present, as Kim suggests in her example of the disastrous Flint water crisis. We've now gone through the introductory section and the detailed walkthrough um, uh, of the film uh, Deadly Migration. So now let's just uh, skip to the last section as we're used to doing called, quote, one nation under God knows what. Um, and we're, we're gonna do this to see what kinds of conclusions Kim has drawn from this media analysis of deadly migration. The MHHS lesson here to learn um, is that this language of viral emergence isn't just the rational inevitable response that has to happen because of the looming threat of disease. No, this is a, this is, um, a culturally constructed series of collective affects or structures of national feeling that has been cultivated by media ecologies represented by that IBM film, Deadly Migration. This kind of nation making, Kim concludes, is unlike the usual way we think about nation making. Um, she cites the seminal work of Benedict Anderson in his book, Imagined Communities, um, published in 1983, to, to get at this usual sense of nationalism. And this is the nationalism you're probably used to. The kind of nationhood that he describes is about commonalities, about shared experiences, about histories, and about cultures. Um, instead of this positive sense of things we have in common, pathogenic nation-making is, quote, rooted in a sense of social fracture. Um, uh, those are Kim's words. Um, in other words, it is rooted in a break between the disease-free us and the contagious them. So instead of the comfortable affect of having things in common, it is about the extreme discomfort of being constantly anticipating the endless mutations of disease. The essay finally concludes by tracking this, um, this discomfort of that American Airlines passenger with whom she began. When this middle-class American, Amer uh, uh, American passenger gets home, Everything around them is an object of suspicion, um, of paranoia, and of uncomfortable affect. The ending figure of NPR's tongue-in-cheek image of alternative greetings that won't spread disease really hits differently, I think, after the COVID-19 pandemic. Here, Kim talks about these moments of preemptive biopreparedness as somewhat amusing, um, with a tinge of overkill. But now we all know that six foot social distancing and elbow greetings became a real serious as death thing during the early days of the pandemic. The conclusion is about this kind of low grade affect of fear and paranoia about the next big disease to come. This is uh, what she means about quote, one nation under God knows what. Um, what she means by that is that we're, we're not exactly sure what this disease to come is, but we're, we're weirdly unified as a nation under this uncertainty. What I want you to think about in the spirit of these academic articles continuing to make us think critically is what kinds of new structures of feeling or media ecologies have emerged after the God knows what, um, after that God knows what was precisely named as COVID-19. The pandemic disaster to come has actually arrived. So think about how Kim's thesis remains relevant in discussing the new media and media ecologies of not our viral emergence, but our viral arrival.